Hello everyone, welcome to Offfield Basics, where the goal of this session over the next hour is to provide you with almost everything you need to know as a medical student or as a general health provider about ophthalmology. So today we will be reviewing concepts in ophthalmology that are deemed essential by both the USMLE as well as the American Academy of Ophthalmologists. But we should step back for a second and ask ourselves why we're doing this. We all know that the eyes are extremely important for health. If you think about it in a systemic way, if you can't see, you're going to have poor medical compliance, you will have more falls, you will be more predisposed to depression, and as such, vision health concerns all of us as health providers. However, it is recognized that ophthalmology is not as emphasized in medical education around the country. And this is manifest in surveys indicating that up to 50% of primary care interns entering their internships have insufficient ophthalmology skills as gauged by their preceptors. We're going to make sure that at the end of this session, you break that statistics and know your ophthalmology. So let's begin by prefacing that this is by no means an in-depth comprehensive review, but rather we will be going over high yield associations and aiming for the breadth of pathology so that you're familiar with a little bit of everything. If you want to learn more, you can always go to optobasics.com where you can take a much more in-depth dive into some of these concepts. So this is what we'll be covering. We'll start off with some anatomy, go on to some eye diseases, then discuss some systemic manifestations of certain eye diseases as well as how these diseases appear in the system in general, and then conclude with some basic eye pharmacology. So when we say we're talking about diseases, we really are going to be aiming for breath. You can use this slide over here as a sort of cheat sheet in order to help you either on the wards or in terms of reviewing for these pathologies. They're all listed by the first chief complaint, such as acute painless vision loss or a painful red eye, as well as a color coding that can help you triage how urgent a particular problem is. Let's begin with some anatomy. Let's talk about the, around the eye. There's six muscles that attach to the eye. The first four are pretty straightforward. You've got the superior rectus that moves the eye superiorly. You've got the inferior rectus that moves it inferiorly, the lateral rectus that moves it laterally, and the medial rectus that moves it medially. The next two are a little bit more confusing. There's a superior oblique that actually acts as a pulley that in towards the eye. It in towards the eye, moves it internally rotating towards the nose, and then you've got the inferior oblique that extorts the eye in that it rotates it away from the nose. In terms of innervation, most of these eye muscles are innervated by cranial nerve 3 with the notable exception of the lateral rectus and the superior oblique. A way to remember this is with the mnemonic LR6SO4, lateral rectus sulfate, if you have it. LR is innervated by cranial nerve 6, and the superior oblique by cranial nerve 4. In terms of what closes and opens the eye, I like you to remember this diagram over here. Cranial nerve 7 closes the eye. Think of a hook that's closing the eye over here. And cranial nerve 3 keeps the eye open. Think of these as pillars over here that are keeping the eye open. Now one thing to note is that the sympathetic nervous system also helps to keep the eye open via Mueller's muscle and that is why in Horner syndrome you can have a droopy eyelid as well. Moving on, let's talk about the conjunctiva. This is simply a mucus layer that starts at the edge of the cornea and it wraps around the eye over on the eyelid. The part next to the sclera of the eye is known as the bulbar conjunctiva, and the part that's attached to the eyelid is known as the palpebral conjunctiva. So, behind the conjunctiva lies the sclera. This is just the white part of the eye. It's a rigid collagenous structure that maintains the eye's um, structure. Moving on, let's talk about some of the other structures in the front of the eye. The cornea is a transparent tissue that's the most densely innervated tissue in the entire body. It's innervated by cranial nerve 5. What this means is that if you have an injury to the cornea, it is going to be extremely painful. The cornea also refracts light. It's not just the lens that does most of the focusing in the eye, but the cornea is the first thing that actually takes light and refracts it onto the or it's the retina. This is why in LASIK surgery, surgeons operate on the cornea and reshape it in order to repair vision. 
Moving on to the iris, this is a muscle that constricts and dilates the eye. Fancy words for that are meiosis and midriasis. Think of meiosis being the smaller word, the hence constrict. Midriasis is the larger word, hence dilate. The iris starts over here and moves backwards to actually become another structure known as the ciliary body. This is a structure that has two purposes. It firstly accommodates the lens via the ciliary muscle that attaches onto these fibers known as the zonular fibers which attach to the lens and help the lens constrict and relax and thereby focus. The ciliary body also produces aqueous humor, which is very important to keeping the front of the eye inflated and is crucial to the understanding of glaucoma. The ciliary body keeps moving backwards over here and forms a layer that encircles the eyeball behind the retina in what's known as the choroid. This is a vascular layer that supplies nutrition to the outer retina. Collectively, these three things are known as the uvea. They're known as the uvea, and that word is important because there are certain diseases that are associated with the uvea, which can include the iris, the ciliary body, or the choroid. Moving on, so this is an empty space between the cornea and the iris, and this is where aqueous humor resides. Recall that aqueous humor is produced by the ciliary body and it's what inflates the front of the eye. Well, specifically, it inflates the anterior chamber that's right over here. Now to understand the flow of fluid from the back uh, where the ciliary body is into the anterior chamber, take a look at this arrow. Aqueous first starts out in the ciliary body and then it flows past the lens through the pupil out into the anterior chamber and finally drains through the trabecular meshwork. Now, in some people, the angle of the trabecular meshwork, which is created between the cornea and the iris, can be very thin, and that is what can predispose someone to angle closure glaucoma. More on that when we talk about the disease. Up next, we've got the lens and the vitreous. So when you think about a lens, I like to think of an M&M, because a lens in the eye has three parts similar to the perfect M&M. At the outside, you've got the shell of the M&M, which is the equivalent to the capsule of the lens. And then moving inwards, you've got the chocolate in the M&M, which is like a lens cortex. And finally, in the center, you've got the nucleus of the lens, which is kind of like the nut at the center of the M&M. When someone has a cataract, their cortex or their nucleus usually gets foggy, and a surgeon goes and makes a hole in the lens capsule and extracts the cortex and nucleus within the capsule and puts in an intraocular implantable lens instead. The vitreous up next is simply a jelly-like substance that resides in the back of the eye over here and it provides nutrients to the retina as well as the lens. Fun fact, the vitreous is where floaters float around which you might see sometimes in your vision. This is the retina that is residing at the back of the eye and it has multiple layers. Now, if we look at a picture of the retina over here, let's highlight some anatomical landmarks. You've got the optic disc over here, which is bounded by the sharp margins around it over here in a circle. In the middle of the optic disc lies the optic cup. This is hard to visualize on 2D images because it's fundamentally a 3D structure. However, on a 3D exam, when you're looking at someone's eye in a slit lamp, it is easier to tell. You might recall that a cup to disc ratio is something that's important in glaucoma. More on that in the pathology section. Moving on, you've got retinal arteries over here. These are usually thinner and lighter colored compared to the retinal veins, which are thicker. Specifically, the ratio of retinal veins to arteries is usually around 3 to 2 in a normal healthy eye. And then lastly, over here in the middle of the eye, you've got the macula, which is the center of our vision. In the center of the macula is an even more sensitive region of photoreceptors known as the fovea, and that's really where the very center of your vision lies. Now, when we look at someone's retina, there's a couple of things that we should comment on. The first thing is going to be looking at the optic nerve. Is there any pallor in the optic nerve? Does it look lighter than it normally does? That could be indicative of ischemia. Is the borders of the optic nerve sharp? Because if they're not and they look fuzzy, that could be indicative of something known as papilledema, which we'll see pictures of. What does the cup to disc ratio look like in the optic nerve? Because if that's increased, that could be a sign of glaucoma. Furthermore, you also want to take a look at the retinal vessels to make sure they're coursing out normally, that there's not 
too many vessels in the retina, which could be indicative of neovascularization, which is a pathologic process that we'll get to see pictures of. Obviously, you want to take a look to see any evidence of retinal bleeding, which we'll see pictures of. And lastly, you want to comment on the presence of any cotton wool spots, exudates, and drusen, because that can also be indicative of certain pathologies. We'll see pictures of all of these in just a bit. We'll start off by talking about acute painless loss of vision. Most of these diseases are going to either be emergencies or things that are very urgent. Someone doesn't lose vision painlessly and acutely and have a benign disease process going on. This should always worry you. Let's begin by talking about a retinal detachment. Now, if you have a patient that comes into your office saying, geez, doc, I was just sitting around and suddenly I started seeing a lot of flashes of light everywhere. And then I began to notice a lot of new floaters that just became apparent in my vision all of a sudden. And then it almost felt like a curtain fell down over my vision. If someone complains of that, then you should always suspect a retinal detachment. If you take a look inside their eye, you'll see something that looks like the pictures that we see on the right. This is a disease that can be common in patients with really poorly controlled diabetic retinopathy. It can be caused by trauma. It can even be caused by pathologic myopia, where your eyeball is very elongated that can predispose you to some detachments. We already went over the signs to expect with this condition. So if you do suspect this is happening, you really need to emergently refer these patients to ophthalmology or to an emergency room in order to assess whether they should get either laser or surgical treatment as early as indicated. Because without appropriate treatment in time, permanent vision loss can occur with this condition as the retina gets detached and is at risk of being permanently disfigured. Up next, we have a retinal artery occlusion. If you have a patient coming to you in your office saying that they were sitting around doing nothing and all of a sudden their vision in one eye went completely dark, and then you auscultate their carotid artery and you hear a carotid bruit, or you end up listening to their heart and you discern that they have atrial fibrillation, or just notice that they have a lot of cardioembolic risk factors, you should be concerned about a retinal artery occlusion. This is essentially a stroke of the eye. A retinal artery occlusion is essentially a stroke of the eye. P patients that have carotid disease or embolic risk factors are predisposed to this. We already talked about the presenting signs of this disease process. So if you suspect this, essentially consider this like a stroke. Refer your patient to the ER immediately for a full stroke workup because their eye has stroked out what can happen next is that they could get a much larger stroke in their brain. So they need to get worked up for this emergently. If you take a look inside these patient's eyes, you'll see what's known as a cherry red macula. There's some pictures of this over here where essentially what you're seeing is a very pale peripheral retina, but in the middle, right over here in the macula, in the foveal region, you'll see a much more darker red retina. And that's because the fovea is the thinnest part of the macula and you're seeing the properly vascularized choroid behind shining through amidst an otherwise very pale and thicker retina. You'll also notice over here you might see these loose, hyperlucent dots inside the arteries. Those are actually embolic plaques. They have a name. They're known as Hollenhorst plaques. Let's move on and talk about a retinal vein occlusion. So this will present as follows. A patient comes to your clinic and says that all of a sudden they're noticing sudden blurry vision, sudden distorted vision, and then you can shine a light into their pupil and you'll see what's known as an afferent pupillary defect. When you're shining the light between their pupils, you'll notice that their pupils aren't constricting equally. You always need to think about a retinal vein occlusion, even though a retinal artery occlusion is also on the differential right now. But when you look inside their eye, you'll see what's shown on the picture on the right. You'll see a very angry looking retina with lots of hemorrhages everywhere. It's known as a blood and thunder retina. That's classic for examination questions, blood and thunder retina. These hemorrhages are multiple flame-shaped hemorrhages. You'll notice how they're starting at the optic nerve region and then they're fanning out 
in all different directions. They're fanning out from the optic nerve. That's what's characteristic of a flame-shaped hemorrhage. This is also going to be in patients that are older that with thrombotic risk factors. In this case, you need to urgently refer them to a retina specialist or an ER. It's not as emergent as a retinal artery occlusion because this is not exactly a stroke, but it's still something that can cause permanent vision loss if not addressed urgently. Let's move on and talk about amaurosis fugax. This is just a fancy word for transient vision loss in the eye. It's essentially a TIA of the eye. In this case, you'll have a patient that comes to you saying that they lost vision in one eye all of a sudden painlessly, but then the vision came back after a few minutes. And what's happened is that they had a, pla a plaque that came and clogged the eye, but then that plaque dislodged and it moved further down the artery and their retina got reperfused and now they can see. Their vision comes back after a few minutes before permanent damage is done. So in this case, what you need to do is refer them for urgent neurovascular workup because this is still a embolic disease process. And maybe they got lucky this time in that this was transient, but who knows when they can throw another embolus into either their eye or even into their brain. So these patients warrant an urgent neurovascular workup. Up next are some pictures of retinal hemorrhages. These can be caused by a whole host of different etiologies, everything from sepsis to infections to diabetes. And the characteristic findings can be along the lines of sudden decreased vision, vision loss, floaters. And when you look into their eye, you'll see red in their eye. You'll see images that look similar to the diagrams that are presented over here. Management of these vary highly based on the type of bleed and the severity of the bleed. So the best thing to do is to urgently refer these to a retina specialist for further medical or surgical management. Up next, we've got giant cell arteritis. This is a examination favorite question because it's one of those things that needs to be treated very emergently and if it is not recognized, it can be potentially vision threatening and even lethal. So if you have a patient that complains to you saying that they are feeling weak, they've had fevers, night sweats, and weight loss over the past few weeks, and their arms feel weak, aka polymyalgia rheumatica, but now they're having a headache on their temple, they're having trouble chewing, and most importantly, now they're getting vision loss you should be concerned about giant cell arteritis. At this point, even if you suspect it and you look into their eye and you see papilledema, you see a chalk white optic disc that's suggestive of ischemia from this disease process, you should not wait for diagnostic confirmation. You should load these patients up with high dose steroids and refer them emergently to an emergency room where they can get further workup of this disease process. The reason why empiric steroids are given in this disease even before diagnostic confirmation, which is usually done with a temporal artery biopsy, is because vision loss can occur rapidly and can be irreversible if not treated empirically. The classic patient for this is most likely going to be a female. They're most likely going to be older and it's likely to be associated with polymyalgia rheumatica like we discussed. Another thing to know, especially for examination purposes, is that one of the worst complications of this disease, apart from the vision loss, is cerebral ischemia and aortic aneurysms. Aortic aneurysms is also a complication of this disease. Moving on, talking about optic nerve compression and optic neuritis. So this can be caused by a whole host of different disease processes. Think about any physical force compressing on the optic nerve. Tumors, hydrocephalus, venous sinus thrombosis, intracranial hemorrhages, all of these can press on the optic nerve and make it look really angry. In the top picture over here, what you're seeing is a lot of papilledema. You're seeing a lot of hemorrhage along the optic nerve over here and here. Note that there's no clear margin where the optic disc ends and that's characteristic of papilledema. In terms of findings, you'll have patients that are complaining of acute vision loss, but specifically, injury to the optic nerve often manifests early on as changes in color vision. So this is one of the important things. If they're noticing color vision changes, you should be concerned about optic nerve damage. 
Now, an exception to the emergent nature of this disease is a disease known as idiopathic intracranial hypertension, aka pseudotumor cerebri. In this disease process, which is a diagnosis of exclusion, you will notice papilledema in the eye, but there isn't any emergent, very dangerous disease process that's causing it. The characteristic patient that's affected by this disease is middle-aged women that are obese, hence the mnemonic of the four Fs, fat female fertile 40, that's affected by this disease. And the treatment for that usually involves weight loss as well as various medical and surgical options as well. You'll notice on the bottom we've got optic neuritis nest. This is most commonly associated with multiple sclerosis and other inflammatory neuropathies. This is most commonly painful, but can also be painless, loss of color vision, afferent pupillary defects, as well as um, other systemic findings that can be associated with multiple sclerosis as well. You'll notice that patients can either present with a very swollen looking disc, but sometimes their disc can also look very ischemic as well. And that's noted by a very pale appearing disc that you can see over here. So both of these can be signs of either optic nerve compression, which is causing ischemia and paleness, or optic neuritis potentially as well. Sometimes patients don't have any fundus exam findings at all, and it might be a disease process where function of the nerve goes before you notice any structural change. Let's begin by talking about an emergent cause of a very painful and acutely red eye, which is known as angle closure glaucoma. Now recall that in our section on the anatomy of the anterior chamber, we talked about how aqueous humor flows from the ciliary body back here across the lens through the pupil and out into the anterior chamber and then the trabecular meshwork. Well, if any of those portions of the flow gets blocked. Maybe the lens plasters up against the iris, or maybe the iris bows forward and plasters up near the cornea, or maybe there's something that's obstructing the trabecular meshwork area. That can cause an acute increase in intraocular pressure leading to angle closure glaucoma. So if you have a patient that comes in saying that they were watching a movie in the dark and all of a sudden they had severe pain in one eye, they're having blurry vision, and then you palpate their eyeball and it's actually hard and you look at their pupil and it looks like the picture over here. It's mid dilated and it's unresponsive and the cornea looks a little hazy. Well, you should suspect angle closure glaucoma. In terms of the epidemiology for this, People of Asian descent tend to have narrower anterior chambers. That means that the angle that's created between the iris and the cornea, this angle is narrow that predisposes the trabecular meshwork to get blocked and that predisposes them to this particular condition. Also patients that have their um, eyes dilated, when their iris gets dilated, it all shrinks up and goes towards the periphery and that clogs up the, interior, the trabecular meshwork as well. So any medications like an anticholinergic drug or sympathomimetic drug, think cocaine, think any drops that dilate the eye can also predispose someone to an angle closure attack. We already talked about what the signs of this are. It's very painful. And what you do in that case is you refer them urgently to the emergency room. And over there, under the guidance of ophthalmology, they're going to get a cocktail of almost every glaucoma drug in the cabinet. It's going to be oral, IV, potentially topical as well. But one way we can actually prevent this from occurring is simply by drilling a hole in the iris using a laser. If you drill a hole across the iris over here, the flow of the aqueous humor, instead of going all the way around through that long route, can now just proceed through a shorter route, which is less likely to get blocked. That procedure is known as a laser iridotomy. Without treatment, this condition can be rapidly progressive in terms of permanent vision loss. So very important to recognize and treat it right away. Let's talk about some less serious causes of red eyes. The first one is blepharitis. This is basically inflammation or an infection of the eyelids. That's what blepharitis means, an inflammation of the eyelids. You'll see something that looks like this on the picture over here. It's going to be crusting around the eyelids. Um, it's going to be more likely to be chronic than something that's acute. 
irritation all around the eye. It's most commonly caused by staph. However, there's a lot of other infective and allergic etiologies associated with this. And the way you treat this is the ophthalmologist's favorite prescription, lid hygiene, making sure you're washing your eyelids frequently, and as well as applying warm compresses with a towel regularly. The next thing we have is a dry eye. Now this seems like a benign condition. A lot of folks that wear contact lenses will sometimes feel that their eyes are dry. To the ophthalmologist though, dry eye disease is a big deal because although it may seem benign, in the long run, dry eyes can be predisposed to a lot of corneal diseases, pain as well as vision loss and infection. A thing to know for your exams is that dry eye doesn't necessarily always occur on its own, but can also be associated with autoimmune diseases like Sjogren's is the most common one. Moving on, let's talk about cellulitis. The most important takeaway from this slide would be to differentiate preceptal cellulitis versus orbital cellulitis. Extremely important. Cellulitis is simply an infection of the skin and the periskin regions. In preceptal cellulitis, it's going to be an infection of your eyelid and the periorbit tissue. Think a swollen, painful eyelid, some erythema, and plus minus some fever, not necessarily. This is relatively benign. You can just treat this with oral antibiotics and close observation. However, if you have the symptoms of preceptal cellulitis, plus, plus either proptosis and or ophthalmoplegia, which basically means that your eye cannot move. Something looks like what you see in the picture over here. Then your patient likely has orbital cellulitis. This means that the infection has progressed into the orbit itself. And that is a medical and surgical emergency because behind the orbit lies your optic nerve, which can get compressed by the infection leading to blindness, but also that's the region where your venous sinuses, cavernous sinus lies. If that gets infected, you can get a cavernous sinus thrombosis. Behind the cavernous sinus lies your brain, so you can also get a brain abscess if this is not emergently treated. So this requires inpatient admission, IV antibiotics, rapid imaging, and even possible surgery to decompress and drain regions of the orbit. We already talked about some of the complications that are feared with this disease. Very important to recognize. If there's anything you remember, remember these cardinal signs of orbital cellulitis, proptosis and ophthalmoplegia, plus your usual signs of swelling, potential fever, and erythema. All right, talking next about conjunctivitis. There's three big categories of conjunctivitis. You've got your bacterial conjunctivitis. This is usually going to be unilateral, and you'll get thick purulent discharge, like the one you see over here. This is most commonly caused by staph aureus, so you just treat this with antibiotic eye drops. However, a couple of things to know is that in newborns, all newborns in the United States get prophylaxis against gonorrhea conjunctivitis because that can be something that is vision threatening to newborns. So right after they're born, they're actually given erythromycin eye drops in order to prevent gonococcal conjunctivitis. Another conjunctivitis that's vision threatening is trachoma. This is caused by chlamydia subgroups A through C. And this is a leading cause of global blindness, especially in countries where there's not good eye care. Children and women are more predisposed to this infection. It starts out as a regular conjunctivitis, but then can scar down the conjunctiva and the cornea leading to permanent vision loss. Up next, you've got viral conjunctivitis. This is just simply your usual pink eye. You know if you've had this disease that it's highly contagious, so you need to make sure that you are using separate towels and practicing good hygiene, hand washing. It's commonly caused by adenovirus and it's self-limiting. Allergic conjunctivitis is basically your springtime allergies. It's IgE-mediated hypersensitivity. You'll get a itchy, tearing eye, and this is just simply treated the way you treat any allergy with antihistamines, artificial tears, and um, measures to ensure comfort. Moving on, scleritis. This is an inflammation of the sclera. And the takeaway point over here is that this usually doesn't occur on its own. It's commonly associated with underlying systemic disorders in most patients. Things like SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, other autoimmune diseases, think scleritis. 
The symptoms of this are usually severe eye pain when you move the eye. If you touch a patient's eye who has scleritis, they are going to have a lot of pain. And in particularly bad cases, you can get such bad inflammation of the sclera that you might get the characteristic blue sclera sign that's seen in this picture over here. Uveitis is another disease that's associated with a lot of systemic conditions, some of which I've mentioned over here. This is an inflammation of the uvea. Recall, the uvea is composed of the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid. So an inflammation of any of these structures is known as uveitis. This will present with dull pain, a red eye, and something called a hypopion. This is a hypopion over here, the white fluid accumulating at the bottom of the anterior chamber behind the cornea. That's actually white blood cells that are depositing in that space over there. This just represents inflammation going on inside the eye. Lastly, you've got endophthalmitis. This is an infection inside the eye, an infection inside the eye. If you take a look in the eye with a slit lamp, you will see white blood cells floating in the vitreous. And this is an emergency because it can lead to rapid blindness if untreated. It doesn't usually occur on its own. You either need to have some sort of eye surgery or some penetrating trauma that introduces these infectious agents inside the eye. It will present with a hazy cornea, a hypopion as well as inflammation of the vitreous scene on slit lamp exam that we already briefly talked about. Moving on, keratitis. This is a frequently tested concept on examinations and is also important to note because it can be very painful. If you have a patient coming in with a lot of eye pain and redness after prolonged contact lens wear, it's usually associated with an infection of the cornea. That's what keratitis means, inflammation or an infection of the cornea. In contact lens wears, it would likely be caused by pseudomonas. Acanthamoeba is another drug that can cause contact lens associated keratitis. However, it's a lot more rare and it's diagnosed when you give antibiotics to these patients and they don't respond to the usual cocktail of antibiotics used to treat pseudomonas. A couple of things about the different viral forms of keratitis. There's two that you need to know about that can be easily confused. There's herpes zoster keratitis and there is herpes simplex keratitis. In zoster, you get reactivation of the varicella virus in one of your trigeminal nerve ganglions, and what you'll notice is there's going to be a painful eye associated with a lot of skin findings. You'll see this eruption along the distribution of cranial nerve 5 unilaterally. If you see that, think zoster ophthalmicus. For herpes simplex keratitis, the picture is a little bit different. You're not going to usually get any big erosions and skin manifestations, but if you put some blue fluorescein dye to visualize the cornea and you see these dendrite looking things over here in yellow, then you know that this is most likely herpes simplex keratitis. The treatment for both of these conditions involves anti um, excuse me, antiviral agents. All right, let's talk about chronic vision loss next. And even though these things are not usually emergencies for the most part, they still comprise of the vast majority of the bread and butter of ophthalmology. Every single one of these conditions are crucial in a regular ophthalmologist's daily practice. Let's begin by talking about refractive errors. This is very straightforward. Myopia just means you're nearsighted. Your eyeball is usually too long and that makes you focus light in front of the retina and it's corrected with lenses. Astigmatism is associated with an irregularly shaped cornea that can't refract light onto one focal point. So you will get multiple focal points in the back over here in your retina. And that is going to be associated with poor blurry vision, both at near and far. Hyperopia is farsightedness where your eyeball is too short and thus it can't see um, things at near vision, you also require corrective lenses to fix this. Now, presbyopia is similar to hyperopia in that you cannot accommodate and see things at near. However, it's caused by the lens becoming harder and losing its ability to focus on to near objects. So slightly different than hyperopia. Presbyopia, something that occurs in older patients. 
Let's talk about cataracts next. If you have a patient coming into your practice saying that they are slowly beginning to notice that they're getting more glare when they're driving at night, their vision's a little bit more foggy and blurry, but otherwise they seem to be doing fine. This is something that they've noticed over the course of months or years, and you take a look inside their eye and you see that it's not easy to visualize their retina. It's hard to get a good red reflex. Well, chances are, that they may have a cataract. Now the pictures over here demonstrate a very, very severe cataract, the likes of which you usually wouldn't see in, this, uh, in the developed world just because we have access to good eye care for the most part. But the things to know is that this disease is associated primarily with age. Everyone gets a cataract if they get old enough, which is why it is the most commonly performed surgery in the United States. Cataracts can also be related to other things, however. Steroid use, especially chronic steroid use, can predispose people to get earlier cataracts. So can eye injuries, as well as radiation and diabetes. For the purposes of examinations, it's very important to know that cataracts can also occur in children, but usually that is a lead point for a systemic disorder, like galactosemia, myotonic dystrophy, and all of these other genetic conditions or infections. We already talked about the symptoms and the treatment for this is very straightforward. You simply get a cataract surgery. They have extremely high success rates and patients recover their vision very well after the surgery. Let's talk about open angle glaucoma. This is known as the silent thief of sight. It's a very, very prevalent form of blindness around the world. If you have a patient in this case that comes into your clinic and says that everything is fine and they're not worried about their vision, but then you take a look inside their eye and you see that their cup to disc ratio, instead of looking like this, which is a little more normal, looks like this where they have a huge cup compared to their disc. And then you measure their intraocular pressure with a tonometer and you notice that it is elevated. It's elevated usually above 20, although this highly varies you should be concerned about glaucoma. If you don't treat this and it continues to progress into its late stages, eventually you will get slow loss of peripheral vision in these patients. And at that point, when the vision loss is noticeable by the patient, the disease is already in its very late stages and the vision loss is permanent. In terms of how this disease is treated, there is a lot of ways to treat it by lowering intraocular pressure. That is the one way we know how to treat this disease is by lowering eye pressure. The way we can do that is through eye drops, we can do it through laser surgeries, and we can do it through actual surgical implants or as well as surgeries to open up the drainage of the eye to decrease pressure. Let's talk a little bit about the glaucoma drugs because this is something that's important to understand both for your exams as well as the prescriptions that your patients may be on. There's two big things to know about these drugs. The drugs can either work by decreasing aqueous humor production. This is kind of like turning off the sink, uh, the turning off the tap, excuse me, in a sink. And what that means is you'll produce less aqueous humor from the ciliary body and hence the pressure will be lower. These drug classes include alpha agonists and beta blockers, as well as carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. The other way to treat glaucoma is by decrease, increasing, excuse me, is by increasing the outflow of aqueous humor. And that is done by a class of drugs known as prostaglandin analogs. Moving on, let's talk about age-related macular degeneration, AMD. This is a leading cause of blindness in patients over 65 years of age in developed countries. If you have a patient coming into your practice saying, geez, doc, I've just been noticing very slowly over the past couple of months to years that straight lines appear a little wavy to me and my vision just seems a little distorted. And then you show them this grid over here. You show them this grid that's known as an Amsler grid an Amsler grid, and instead of seeing straight lines, they notice all these distorted lines over here, or they notice some scotomas, they notice some places where they don't see those lines. You should be concerned about age-related macular degeneration. You'll take a look inside these patients' eyes, and on their retina, what you'll see are these deposits over here, these hard-looking yellow, well-defined deposits known 
as drusen, these deposits progress in the macula to become this island-like structure over here. This is called geographic atrophy, which is seen in the later stages of the disease. There's not really much we can do for this disease except controlling risk factors, the biggest one of which is smoking. There's some evidence that says that providing a certain cocktail of vitamins known as the AREDS vitamins also helps slow down the progression of this disease. But apart from that, this is a progressive disease about which not too much can be done. We've so far talked about the dry form of the disease. However, in a certain subset of patients, the disease could start off with the dry form and then progress to the wet form, which is characterized by the retina getting ischemic, demanding more oxygen. And in response to the increased oxygen demand, you get proliferation of these abnormal blood vessels. If you take a look over here, there's just a crazy amount of blood vessels everywhere. And you'll notice that these blood vessels are bleeding. That bleeding can cause fluid leakages, it can cause further ischemia, and it can lead to rapid blindness. And that is treated by an anti-VEGF injection. Anti-VEGF drugs simply work by pro prohibiting angiogenesis, prohibiting proliferation of these abnormal blood vessels that are very, very destructive in the retina. Let's talk about diabetic retinopathy. Diabetic retinopathy is the most common cause of blindness in patients aged 25 to 74 in the United States. If you have a patient who's coming in with diabetes and they're completely asymptomatic, you still need to be worried about this disease and screen them. In the early stages, it's gonna be completely asymptomatic. However, as it progresses, it can predispose patients to the risk of bleeding as well as distortions in their vision and irreversible vision loss. There's two types of the disease. The non-proliferative type is the early form of it in which you'll see microaneurysms, exudates, cotton wool spots, and small hemorrhages in the retina. You'll notice over here, these yellow things are exudates. These small looking dots are microaneurysms. And then on this second picture over here, this fluffier looking yellow spot is a cotton wool spot. This is non-proliferative, usually asymptomatic. If you don't treat it early on, it's gonna pro progress to proliferative type, which is characterized primarily by neovascularization. We just talked about neovascularization in the previous side. Same thing happens over here. You'll notice all these abnormal blood vessels everywhere. These can bleed, these can pull on the retina and cause detachments of the retina, and they're very bad for vision and need to be treated aggressively. The way you can treat this, first and foremost, is with blood sugar control. Obviously, the best thing to do is prevent these things from happening in the first place, but if they're already happening, you can use that same anti-VEGF injection to prevent the proliferation of those vessels. You can also use a laser technique called laser photocoagulation, which basically burns off the peripheral retina so that there is a lesser demand for oxygen and thus less proliferation of these vessels. That's laser photocoagulation. Or you can also do invasive surgeries to repair any retinal detachments or retinal bleeding forms of eye traumas. Let's start by talking about going to the eye and damage the front surface of the cornea. These are extremely painful. Recall that the cornea is the most densely innervated tissue in the body. It's going to be associated with a foreign body sensation, something in the eye. You're going to have tearing, photophobia as well. And the way you visualize what the damage is to the cornea is by putting in blue fluorescein drops into the eye that is going to show focal uptake where the cornea has been damaged, something looking like this. We want to make sure that you actually evert the eyelids to ensure that there's nothing still stuck inside the eyelids that could cause further damage whenever you blink. The way you treat this after taking out the foreign body is by giving NSAIDs for pain and also prophylaxing with some antibiotics to prevent any corneal infections. Up next, you've got chemical injury. This is every ophthalmologist's nightmare. This can be caused either by acids or alkaline substances entering the eye. Alkaline substances are worse just because they can keep melting through the eye as opposed to acids, which coagulate the surface of the eye and stop there. So whenever someone's using bleach or a drain cleaner, they need to exercise extreme precaution and use protective eye equipment. However, if they get substances like those in the eye, what needs to be done immediately is to irrigate, 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 even before taking a full history. As soon as you suspect this, you need to irrigate as soon as possible because that is what will make all the difference. 
even after you're done initial irrigation. What do you do after that? Continue to irrigate some more for at least 30 minutes until that substance is neutralized, all the while calling ophthalmology emergently in order to do a further assessment of what needs to be done. Up next, we've got a hyphema. This is a fancy word for just having blood in the anterior chamber. Recall, a hypopion was white cells in the anterior chamber. A hyphema is blood in the anterior chamber. And this looks fairly bad, but it's actually relatively innocuous most of the time. It can be caused by uh, trauma. It can be caused by a variety of other bleeding disorders as well. But the thing to worry about in this case is making sure that there's not any evidence of angle closure glaucoma because of all of this blood blocking the trabecular meshwork inside the anterior chamber, causing a spike in intraocular pressure. It may also warrant a systemic workup to make sure that this patient doesn't have any bleeding disorders. Up last, we've got a globe rupture, and this is also every ophthalmologist's worst nightmare. This is a full thickness injury that goes penetrating into the eye and causes the eye to open up. The globe gives way. In this particular case, you want to make sure to avoid eye examination as much as possible to prevent further displacement of structures inside the eye and call ophthalmology emergently because they will need to do some sort of surgery in order to put the contents back together and preserve the eye. If that's not possible after surgical exploration, it may warrant an enucleation, which is where you remove the eyeball because if you don't do that, you get this condition known as sympathetic ophthal ophthalmia. This is basically an autoimmune phenomena where the antigens inside this eyeball get exposed to the immune system after the eyeball has a rupture. And using those antigens, the immune system can now attack the remaining healthy eye and cause bilateral blindness. One more note over here on a specific ED procedure called canthotomy and cantholysis. This is something that's associated with ocular compartment syndrome. What this is, is an emergency which is caused by some sort of rapid pressure buildup behind the eyeball. It could be a retrobulbar hematoma, it could be a tumor, it could be cellulitis, but you'll notice that there will be a rapid increase in pressure, painful eyeball, it's going to be bulging out, the intraocular pressure is likely going to be high, and when you suspect this, it can cause blindness in under an hour. So it's very important to open up the orbit space, relieve some of that pressure by exposing it to the outside. And that's done by cutting out the lateral border of the canthus and thereby exposing the orbital contents towards the anterior regions and thereby prevent acute pressure associated permanent vision loss. You do this even before getting diagnostic imaging. It's a clinical diagnosis just because of how emergent it is. Let's talk about pediatrics, three main things that we're going to be covering today. Let's look at retinoblastoma. It's caused by a mutation in the retinoblastoma gene. It can be bilateral and is often frequently associated with other tumors like osteosarcomas and pinealomas as well. The key exam finding is going to be leukocoria, which means a white reflex instead of a normal red reflex, which you can see over here. Early diagnosis and management using multimodal oncologic care is crucial for preserving vision as well as preserving life, because if not treated early on, this can be something that is lethal. Up next is retinopathy of prematurity. This is a disease that's found in preterm infants, commonly those that are under 1,500 grams birth weight or those that are being given supplemental oxygen in the newborn ICU. Basically, in a premature infant, the retinal blood vessels have not finished developing fully. So as an ophthalmologist, you have to make sure that they are developing normally, and if they aren't, it might warrant treatment including lasers and other modalities and needs to be followed very closely to prevent vision loss. Strabismus is a problem with eye alignment. Strabismus is basically unaligned eyes that can be caused by a lot of different causes, genetic, refractive, muscular insertion issues. The things to know first off for terminology is that esotropia is an inward alignment issue, whereas exotropia is an outwards alignment issue. Over here, you'll see this particular patient has esotropia. The way you diagnose this 
is by doing a cover uncover test, which basically will cause the misaligned eye to flip back into normal position once you cover the other eye. And the, the way you treat this is going to be with either prism glasses that can correct the vision coming into the eye, as well as eye patches, surgeries to the muscles to pull the eye back into normal position, as well as addressing any underlying issues causing this. Lastly, you've got amblyopia. This basically means a lazy eye. This is a problem in children that arises from one eye being weaker than the other. This can be caused by one eye having a congenital cataract. It can be caused by refractive errors. It can even be caused by strabismus. And what happens in kids is an interesting neurological phenomena where the dominant eye that sees better just takes over and the brain shuts off the less well-seeing eye. And as a result, Plasticity in the brain ensures that that process slowly becomes permanent and that will lead to permanent vision loss in the less seeing eye. So the way you treat this is going to be to make sure you correct the underlying cause as well as patch the dominant eye, thereby forcing the patient to see with the less powerful eye and ensuring that they're building those brain connections early on. Let's talk about some eye movement disorders and this is our last section on the various eye diseases few things to address over here. The first is thyroid eye disease. This is a disease that pathognomonically looks like this. If you see a patient coming in with bilateral proptosis in that their eyes are bulging forward, you can see the sclera under their, corne uh, under their cornea and iris, both at the bottom and the top, and their eyes are bulging out this way, you should be concerned about thyroid eye disease. This is an autoimmune phenomena that's associated with orbital fibroblast proliferation that's associated with the immune system that's also affecting various thyroid conditions like Graves and Hashimoto's. It's not actually associated with the hyperthyroid state as much as it's associated with the immune response to it. In terms of risk factors, smoking is a factor that makes this disease worse. It's very important to counsel patients to stop smoking. Other things that can affect it is radioactive iodine treatment for the actual thyroid disease can make the eye disease worse. The management of this is complex and long term and involves ensuring that the eye is protected, especially when it's bulging out like that, it can get dry, so you need to protect that with tears. You can also have severe disease manifestations that could necessitate steroids, it could necessitate decompression surgery or further advanced pharmacologic therapy. Let's quickly talk about the nerve palsies and we'll briefly touch on them because there's a lot that can be unpacked over here. Cranial nerve three palsy is the classic down and out eye, which you can see over here. This eye is pointing in this direction, down and out. It's also associated with a blown pupil, which is basically a midriatic pupil because pupil constriction is controlled by cranial nerve three, which is now malfunctioning. A droopy eyelid is also associated with this. Recall from anatomy that cranial nerve 3 innervates the levator muscle that keeps the eye open. This can be caused by a variety of causes. It can be vascular compromises of the nerve due to chronic issues like diabetes or hypertension or some very serious life-threatening etiologies like tumors, aneurysms, cavernous sinus, thrombosis, amongst others. Cranial nerve 4 palsy can be caused by similar etiologies as cranial nerve 3, but the classic sign you'll see is that patients will tilt their head away from the lesion. Recall that cranial nerve 4 innervates the superior oblique that intorts the eye towards the nose. It intorts the eye towards the nose. So, if you lose that ability, you'll try to compensate with your head by tilting it in that direction, which is also the direction that's away from the eye that's affected. A cranial nerve 6 palsy manifests in an inability to use your lateral rectus muscles. In this particular patient, he's trying to look in this direction. This eye is doing fine, but this eye cannot do that because he has a cranial nerve 6 palsy on this side. This can be due to the same factors as above, in addition to in increased intracranial pressure. That is one of the interesting phenomena seen in pseudotumor cerebri, a cranial nerve 6 palsy in some cases. Lastly, you've got a cranial nerve 7 palsy. This is also known as a Bell's palsy when it's idiopathic, and this can be due to a variety of reasons. I encourage you to look at some neuro neurologic videos in order to learn more about this palsy, but for ophthalmology purposes, this is going to manifest with an inability to close the eye as well as a facial droop that will affect the entire face if the lesion is an upper motor neuron lesion as well, uh, or only the lower face if the lesion is a lower motor neuron lesion. 
Obviously, because these patients won't be able to close their eye, you need to worry about dry eye disease and ensure that they have adequate lubrication and protection. All right, so now we're done with all eye diseases, and we're just going to very briefly touch on eye manifestations of systemic diseases. Let's begin by talking about hypertension. This is similar to diabetes in that it can cause microvascular damage, both in the kidneys as well as in the retina. It can predispose you to retinal hemorrhages because you can get a lot of microaneurysms and vascular compromises. And on your retinal exam, your findings are going to be similar to diabetic retinopathy. Recall the exudates, the cotton wool spots. However, in severe hypertension, you can also get papilledema. Recall that papilledema is a swelling of the optic nerve that manifests as not being able to see a clear demarcation or border of the optic disc. The way you treat this is just by making sure that patients are controlling their systemic blood pressure adequately. Up next is sickle cell disease. This is an eye disease that is more common in patients that have the HBSC genotype or the HBS thalassemia genotype compared to being homozygous for sickle cell disease. The way this will manifest is with eye pain, you'll have redness, you can have decreased vision, floaters. It's basically going to result in microvascular compromise in the eye. In terms of diagnosis, you can see characteristic changes in conjunctival blood vessels on your slit lamp exam as a trained ophthalmologist, as well as some retinal abnormalities indicative of ischemia. You can get ischemia in this disease that can lead to neovascularization. Recall that neovascularization is that awful condition where you grow abnormal vessels that can bleed and tug on the eye causing detachments, and that's what can happen in sickle cell disease. The way we control this disease is by systemic disease control across the body as well as using those anti-VEGF injections to prevent neovascularization. HIV retinopathy is one of those diseases that manifests with ongoing HIV infection directly damaging the retina. However, in addition to HIV itself causing retinal damage, being immune compromised can predispose you to other diseases of the retina like CMV retinitis, which classically manifests with a pizza pie retina. You'll see a lot of white spots as well as hemorrhage that represents the, the pizza cheese and, and tomato sauce, which is where this gets its name from. If you suspect this when you do your direct ophthalmoscopic exam in a patient with AIDS, you should think CMV retinitis. Obviously, being immune compromised predisposes to a lot of other conditions such as Kaposi sarcoma, squamous cell carcinoma, as well as a whole host of neuroophthalmic diseases. Lastly, just making a plug here for different autoimmune diseases, remember that a lot of different autoimmune diseases like the ones I've listed over here are associated with eye findings, notably things like scleritis, uveitis, and dry eye disease. All right, we're at the last section on eye pharmacology. Let's begin by talking about systemic medications that can have side effects on the eye. The first thing to look at is any sort of drug that can dilate the eye. Think of your sympathomimetic drugs or your anticholinergics. These drugs can also predispose you to angle closure glaucoma. Remember that and look back at our section on angle closure glaucoma to learn how this happens. Steroids, both topical on the eye as well as systemic, can also worsen eye infections. This should make intuitive sense because steroids suppress the immune system, but they can also worsen glaucoma and accelerate cataract formation as well, which is why ideally we don't like to have patients on chronic long-term steroids as ophthalmologists. Hydroxychloroquine is also another drug that can have ophthalmic manifestations, characteristically something known as a bullseye maculopathy. You can see a picture of the bullseye right over here on the retina. This can lead to irreversible retinal damage, and that's why prolonged use of this drug, often for autoimmune conditions, requires regular eye examinations in order to see whether this condition is developing. Lastly, let's talk about systemic effects of ocular medications. There are a variety of drugs in ophthalmology that are used like beta blockers for glaucoma, alpha agonists for glaucoma, as well as anticholinergics for a variety of reasons. And recall from your basic pharmacology lectures that all of these drugs have a wide range of systemic side effects. If you put these drugs in the eye, they do get systemically absorbed, and hence you will have similar side effects on ocular ad administration of these drugs as you do with systemic as well. The way you can avoid this is by squeezing on your eye punctum when you're putting these drugs in just so that most of them don't drain in 
through the tear ducts into your systemic circulation and thus exacerbate systemic side effects. All right, and with that, we finish our basic high yield rapid fire review of ophthalmology. I hope you found this useful and would like to remind you that this is crucial, not just to knowing basics of ophthalmology for your exams, but also going forward as a healthcare provider in ensuring that our patients can have the vision with which they can make sure that they're taking their medications properly, make sure that they're avoiding falls, making sure that they're avoiding a lot of psychiatric manifestations such as depression and anxiety associated with low vision loss and improving their quality of life. That is ultimately the goal of the ophthalmologist to improve quality of life, which is a goal that's shared by all healthcare professions. And hopefully by watching this video today, you are going to contribute to ensuring that our patients get the best eye care possible. If you want to learn more about any of these conditions, I encourage you to go on our website, optobasics.com, where there's going to be more information about each of these conditions that can help you learn more about the eye. Thank you so much.